And good afternoon, another warm day in uh, Texas. Glad to have each of you with us. We are the Price Group and uh, we welcome you to our webinar today. Our topic is retirement planning timeline. We've got quite a bit of information for you, but we also wanna address some of the specific issues slash questions that you may have. If you have a specific question you'd like us to address during the webinar, you can type your questions into the chat box and we'll try to answer them. Uh, our goal is uh, 35 to 40 minutes, uh, uh, depending on the amount of questions at the end. So uh, with that, again, thank you for being here and uh, let's get started. Who are we? Uh, we are a fiduciary centric, family owned and operated uh, boutique specializing in retirement planning. 90% of our clients are uh, retired or either close to retirement. Uh, yours truly, Randy Price, along with, uh, with Matt Price, we're both certified financial planners. This is our passion, this is what we do. And we're gonna to try to share some of the things that may be on your mind as we go through the following slides. A little bit about our firm. Uh, we have a few different custodians, back offices that we do work with, Raymond James being one of them. Raymond James currently being the only one, we're actually rolling out a few more here in the coming months. Uh, but our firm, Steward Partners, based off the biblical definition of stewardship, actually have, this is a little bit dated, we have about 25 billion of assets. Our team, the price group, we help manage between 600 and 700 million dollars. Uh, what that means to you is this is not our first rodeo. Like Randy said, we operate as a fiduciary. We think that is very, very, did I say very important. And uh, everything we do is predicated around helping people retire should you listen to us, we've, we've been very humbled. Randy's received a number of accolades from Barron's Forbes Financial Times. If you're on our weekly email, you've received our Wealth Coach, Coach podcast. We're pushing out blogs on a regular and uh, periodic basis. And we both attended the University School of Business uh, at Wharton to obtain our SEMA Certified Investment Management Analyst designation. We think education is really important. We continue with that continuing education on an annual basis, and uh, uh, we, we think we have some good stuff here to talk about. So let's look at today's agenda. Uh, part one, retirement planning. You're two to five years out. You're just starting to think about how wonderful retirement would be. Retirement planning less than one year out. Wow, you're almost there. You're just wanting to make sure you dot your I's and cross your T's. And then uh, number three on the agenda, we're gonna start planning for after re retirement where uh, every day is a Saturday and uh, you do uh, do anything that you want every day of the week. So let's start with retirement planning uh, two to five to five years out. We talk about looking before you leap. We're gonna talk time and time again, if you know us uh, at all on creating a wealth and an investment plan for your retirement. If it's not written down, it's not a true plan. We want you to develop a family index number. We'll talk a little bit about that, but what rate of return do you need to be successful? You want to evaluate your retirement plan contributions, your allocations. We don't want you to be 100% invested in the company stock and the company stock take a big heat cup. And then all of a sudden you have to forego your plans or cut back your retirement, make changes in uh, vocational uh, uh, monies during retirement. Um, when alongside of that, considering the consequences of a negative year in the stock market, how it's effect on your retirement date and your standard of living. Many times people are heavier uh, allocated towards stocks five, 10, 15 years from retirement. As you get closer to retirement, uh, we think that it's a good idea to start feathering that back and approaching the, uh, the level of investment in stocks, risk assets, if you will, that you want to be all throughout your retirement. We also think uh, sitting down and talking with a qualified advisor, a lot of advisors out there, not all are qualified, not all are certified, but someone who specializes in retirement planning. We talk about if you needed a heart surgery, you wouldn't want a doctor who does big toes on Monday, gallbladders on Tuesday, knees on Wednesday. And if he had a case, uh, hearts on Thursday, you want something, someone that does hearts morning, noon and night, every day of, of the week. So. Uh, Anyway, there we go. Is your spreadsheet adequate? And we've seen some spreadsheets. Oh my, um, I've, uh, 
I've had extra strong reading glasses and still had uh, a, a time uh, for uh, one spreadsheet. I remember went all the way across the uh, the table in our conference room. Um, but better than nothing as far as spreadsheet, but we think uh, that Monte Carlo planning simulation is much better than just having a spreadsheet. And uh, um, the bottom line for this slide is the sequence of returns during the accumulation phase while you're working, while you're saving for retirement has no effect on how much money you end up with prior to retirement. And you can see uh, there on the left-hand side, the green numbers, we start out with 29% positive rate of return year one, have a string of 7% positive rates of return uh, and voila, then we have a negative 15% rate of return in year 10. Uh, and so uh, in the bottom of that, we started, at, we flip it and we go negative 15% in year one, and we have a 29% uh, return in year, year 10, and we end up at the same place. So you say sequence of returns, do I really care? Well, if you're prior to retirement, the answer is no, because it does not make a difference at all. But if you look at the slide on the right, performance with $10,000 per year withdrawals has a big difference. Actually, the red lines on the bottom of the right-hand side show you running out of money. That's never good. And so there is a dramatic difference in planning for retirement where you do have, um, you do have the negative returns up front. So the sequence of returns is very important, and uh, that's why we, we will recommend Monte Carlo simulation in the modeling that we do for folks. And what this does is we show you retiring a thousand times. We show you what your probability of success is. And if the probability is not where you feel comfortable, we talk about it retirement, the three C's, clarity, comfort, and confidence. And we can redo that till you're happy with the, uh, with the results based on the uh, inputs. So bottom line sequence of returns does have a dramatic effect when you're in the distribution phase, when you have already retired. So you need more than just an investment guy. That's uh, something we say on a regular basis. You need a wealth coach. Well, you know, you say, well, I've been doing fairly well. We think uh, if golf is probably one of the great uh, examples here probably one of the greatest golfer, if not the greatest uh, in the world, Tiger Woods, has a swing coach, has a, has a, has a coach to help him with uh, some things that might sneak up on him and things he's doing a little bit different or not doing exactly right. Uh, and so we practice holistic financial planning, holistic wealth planning. We look at retirements, we look at investments, we look at insurance, we look at cash flow, we look at income tax, we look at estate planning, uh, Benjamin Graham, who's one of Warren Buffett's mentors, said the best way to measure your investing success is not by whether you're beating some arbitrary uh, index, but whether you put in place a financial plan and, very important here, a behavioral discipline that's likely to get you where you want to go. So that's our goal for each and every one that comes to see us. And uh, again, everyone needs a wealth coach. So what should a retirement plan include? One, one uh, thing to mention prior to, to listing a few things on that is retirement is not an event. It's an ongoing process. So this live well plan we're talking about, it's not something we create and then put in the proverbial drawer and, and don't look at ever again. We're updating this for clients on a regular and consistent basis. At least once a year, uh, this helps with making big decisions on potential second home purchases? Do I take a retirement package that the company is offering? Go down the list of big financial decisions that may or may not have to be made down the road. Uh, we don't think if you've written your plan down, it's really not a meaningful plan. But a few things the retirement roadmap will help you answer. How much can you spend in retirement? How long will your money last? What rate of return do you need? That's that family index number Randy mentioned earlier. Our goal, unless you would tell us otherwise, is we want to illustrate the least amount of risk possible that you need to take for you to be, quote, successful. And success is however you would define it. And then how do you invest your portfolio for in retirement for increasing income, inflation, and also protection of principal? Another big 
piece that we, we don't mention here, though, is a lot of clients will have goals of leaving a certain dollar amount of, of inheritance to the next generation or possibly to give to charities, whatever the case might be. And we can solve backwards for, say, you wanted to leave, pick a number, $2 million to the next generation. Uh, what rate of return do we need to achieve those goals? So we'll have some clients say that they have these goals. We'll have other clients say that they want the check to the undertaker to balance. So no right or wrong answer there, but the planning is, is important. Like we said, we call our plan the Live Well Plan because Randy and I are partially cheesy, but we really do want clients to live well in retirement. So a little bit more on that family index number. What rate of return do you need? And how do I get there with the least amount of risk? And so this is a, a personalized measurement that we put together so that you can not only track your investment portfolio, but you can put it together with how it correlates with your goals. And so in addition to monthly statements, what we provide is a, a, a summary, we call it our wealth management review, to where you, you're tracking against this family index number, say it's 5%, for example. And is your portfolio outperforming this 5% index number? Is it underperforming? And, and so some years will outperform, some years will underperform this, but our goal is to have your investment portfolio average this family index number rate of return over a market cycle. And so market cycles, they tend to last 10 to 15 years. So factor in some good years, some bad years, some sideways years, and we would love to average this family index number. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to make the complex a little more simple. There's a lot of moving pieces with retirement planning, whether you're on the verge of retirement or have recently retired, and this is a way to really fine tune a lot of this noise, a lot of this information down to one, one salient important number on, on how the portfolio is, is operating. And we thought it'd be helpful in this webinar to, to throw in a few, uh, I'd say tangible ways that you can, you can make some changes now for your planning. The, the first idea of our two ideas, backdoor Roth contribution. Now, Roth, a Roth IRA, when you put money in, it grows tax-free. When you take the money out, it's not taxed. And, and so this is a great vehicle in retirement for a few reasons, that, that when the money comes out, it's not counted as, as taxable income, but then also there's no required minimum distributions currently on Roth IRAs. So it's a great vehicle for, for multi-generational planning. It's a great vehicle for, for long-term growth strategies. It's typically the last bucket, bucket of money that we will use when compared to a pre-tax 401k or IRA or, or after-tax accounts. But <clears throat> how this would work, you put money in, and there are, there are phase-outs on when you can do this. So let's assume that you're above the phase-out of when you can put money into a Roth IRA directly, that starts between $180,000 and $200,000 and then uh, phases out from there. But what you do is you put money into a traditional IRA, non-deductible, and then you do a Roth conversion on that IRA. Now, you will owe taxes on any gain, <clears throat> but if you put in 6000 on a Monday, you do the conversion on Tuesday. You just kept it in cash in the interim. There's obviously no gain there. You need to report this on, on your taxes. We're not, we're not giving tax advice. That's something we would say uh, uh, follow the direction of your CPA, but it needs to be included on a, a tax return, but no taxes owed. Now, the caveat to this is that step three, the pro rata rule. This will not work if you have other existing pre-tax IRA dollars because they don't, you can't just carve out doing this Roth conversion uh, for, for one piece. You have to take the whole IRA into account. But you can do it if you only have pre-tax 401k dollars. So 401k and IRA, it sounds like they're the same. There's a lot of similarities, but from the government's perspective, they, there are some salient differences. 
And the second idea is, is similar, but not the same, a backdoor Roth 401k contribution. So some 401k providers will allow you to make not a pre-tax, not a Roth, but an after-tax contribution into your 401k. And most of the time, once again, this is contingent upon the, the 401k provider, but most of the time you can take those after-tax dollars and do a Roth conversion inside the 401k uh, uh, at retirement as an in-service distribution or separation of service. So a, another great planning tool to supercharge those Roth dollars for an upcoming retirement. Another thing we'll talk about, evaluating your risk budget. This is a, a busy chart here in the bottom right side of your screen, but, but I think it paints a very nice picture. The, the purple line is the stock market, the S&P 500 from 2000 to the end of 2015. And the green line is what if you only got 50% of the downside, but you only got 50% of the upside. And what you'll see here is you actually, during this time period, you've outperformed the overall stock market. And so would a 25% correction delay your retirement? Well, it, it depends. It depends on your personal situation. That's something we plug into our Live Well plan. We do some, some planning on that and uh, what percentage are you invested in stock. So we'll see a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, people come see us. We'll say, what kind of investor are you? And <laughs> we've never had someone actually say they're an aggressive investor, but we'll look at their investment portfolio and they're 90, 100% in stocks. And, and two thumbs up, A plus job, because it's been the perfect environment to own stocks since 2009. Now, moving forward, we're not as optimistic as we have been over the past 10 years. That doesn't mean we dislike stocks, but that does mean we think you should throttle back your risk budget if you're on the eve of retirement to be a little more in line with the type of investment portfolio you plan to have in retirement. So a salient question here, should you consider hiring an advisor well, we want to uh, give you some, uh, if you will, perspective with regards to that. A uh, couple of things that are going to happen during retirement. Uh, emotions matter quite a lot when you are investing. When you're retired, mistakes are much more costly. Uh, are you the type of person that uh, would like to reduce stress? Um, using an advisor will lead to greater investment options, perhaps in alternative investments, individual bonds. And uh, according to some studies, the uh, average investor has, uh, has underperformed because of uh, not being in the market at the correct time. Many of you all may remember Mr. Peter Lynch, who was the uh, manager of a world famous mutual fund for one of the large mutual fund companies. And uh, he had a really great track record. And one time he was doing a, uh, a conference and he asked for questions and the person raised their hand. They said, Mr. Lynch. And he said, yes. They said, uh, what's the biggest regret you have as a manager for your mutual fund company? And they expected to say, well, I was holding some cash when I shouldn't have, or I should have bought you know, this stock or that stock, or I didn't sell uh, this one stock that lost money uh, uh, quick enough. And with, uh, without even a moment's hesitation, he said, oh, that's really simple. He said, the average investor in my fund came nowhere close to the average return of my fund. And uh, the person looked a little bit confused. And he went on to explain that the mutual fund companies can track investor number 14 or 14,000 when they put money in, when they took money out, and then they can... Uh, they can uh, uh, calculate some statistics on what the average investor made. And again, the average investor, stock market was doing well, maybe uh, uh, after a couple of good years, they say, well, the stock market's looking well, I'm gonna, looking good, I'm going to put some money in. And then the stock market drops and they say, see, I can't ever, you can't make any, any money investing in stocks. 
while the, the, uh, the, the successful investor has, uh, has bought when things are, are, are less uh, positive, where there's blood in the streets, sometimes they're talking about, and made money as the stock market went higher. So uh, anyway, good book uh, called Beating, Beating the Street. So that sort of concludes our two to five year retirement planning. Let's, uh, let's move on uh, as, the time, as the clock chimes and move to in retirement planning for less than one year out. You don't, want, you don't want to do a better estimate of your income needs in retirement. Lots of times it's uh, about half of what you make, but that needs to be adjusted by any gifts or any special purchases. Um, we've had clients buy motor homes. We've had clients want to make gifts to children, buy a second home, um, do some home improvements, et cetera. You'll also want to spend some time looking if you're fortunate to have a defined benefit uh, pension plan where it's the lump sum option. Uh, taking the monthly retirement annuity versus the lump sum is, uh, is something to spend some time on. Whether you're under 59 and a half or over 59 and a half will determine how we can get you money without the 10% the, the, the penalty. Uh, that plays into creating a retirement income strategy. Uh, and again, if you're under 59 and a half, uh, it can be done, but uh, it gets a little bit more, more complicated. Uh, how to maximize tax brackets, this sort of thing. We're creating a specific personalized retirement income strategy for your family. You're gonna monitor your retirement plan discount rates if you have a lump sum uh, uh, and you're leaning toward that. Uh, you're gonna keep an eye on ordinary income and capital gains tax rates. And um, if you uh, are planning to, uh, to, to seek some help during the, this period of time, you certainly want someone who's qualified someone who is fiduciary centric and uh, has a team that is focused on just this retirement planning. So what about income needs during retirement? Inflation, 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 we call inflation the hidden tax. 4% uh, inflation will double your cost of living in 18 years. 6% uh, inflation will double your cost of living in 12 years. So it's very conceivable if you retire early say in your 50s or possibly your early 60s, you could see inflation really eat up some of your purchasing power. Uh, one of the things uh, that uh, needs to be talked about, looked at, is uh, what uh, does your family look out, look like uh, with regard to your children? We, we, uh, we make the joke that the bank of mom and dad never closes. It's always open and um, uh, it, it's interesting. Many, uh, many people have a family where one child may, may squeak when they walk, they're so tight, and the other one, the money literally falls out of their pockets. Obviously, I'm being facetious, but uh, anyway, what uh, help you're willing to, to, uh, to do for uh, some of your uh, children or extended family really will uh, determine what your income needs in retirement will look like. Big ticket items, again, we're buying a second place, a motor home, a motorcycle. Uh, we're gonna you know, travel the, uh, uh, travel the world for six months out of the year, et cetera. Uh, looking at what are your ongoing fixed, what are your ongoing variable expenses? If you have a big mortgage, obviously that's a fixed expense. If uh, you don't know anybody during retirement, which is uh, the way we would like to see it, then your variable expenses are just what you end up spending. If you take two trips a year, it's going to cost more than typically than one trip a year, but that expense is, is variable. And then, then gifts to your family. Um, how much you might want to give a uh, uh, member back to, uh, to someone who thought they were just going to have one or two grandchildren and they were very generous with the first one and then the second one came along and they didn't feel like they could do anything different. And then the third one came along and the fourth one. And finally, about eight grandchildren later, the client admitted, I wish I had pulled back because it really toned down their standard of living because of uh, how excited they'd been with the first grandchild. Rule of thumb, 70 to 80% of your, uh, your final salary is typically what people spend during retirement. So is 3% the new 4%? We actually sent out a blog on our, our email list earlier today talking about this more in detail. So happy to send that. Shoot me an email afterwards if you did not get that this morning. But there's an old rule, the 4% rule, a study done in the 70s, 80s, and 90s saying that you can take out 4% of your investment portfolio in retirement, get a raise on a regular and consistent basis, uh, owning a, a balanced portfolio of stocks and bonds, 
and have the confidence that you'll never run out of money. And while the study is 100% accurate based off history, we're raising one eyebrow or maybe another way to say it, we're a little more apprehensive to just believe it with our whole heart. And the reason for it being, look where interest rates were in the 70s, the 80s, the 90s compared to today. Uh, for comparison, the 10-year U.S. government bond this morning is at 1.2, 1.3%. Interest rates are at historic lows, which means for the non-stock piece of your portfolio, it's becoming harder and harder to produce reliable, consistent income. And so that's a big piece of, of planning that we go through. What does a fixed income portfolio look like currently in retirement? Bottom line, we think you need to be more interest rate agnostic, meaning we don't think you need to be taking this bond or interest rate risk that, that you have we, we have been taking for clients in the past just based off where we are in the interest rate cycle. So is 3% the new 4%? Should you take out 3% of a retirement portfolio? Maybe. The, the planning is, is very tailored, very specific, obviously depends on how much money you're going to spend in retirement how old you are in retirement, but we do answer this, this question in detail when we create and put together a personalized live well plan. So if you're fortunate again to have a defined benefit uh, retirement plan, uh, you're faced with a decision whether you'll take a lump sum or you'll take a monthly retirement uh, check. There's, uh, there's uh, advantages to each of those. Let's look at that, the company, uh, the company check on the uh, income for life, the company takes the investment risk. You have uh, on the other side of the fence, you have limited flexibility. If you're, there is inflation, your purchasing power is diminished by inflation. Um, again, uh, the company is, uh, doesn't have uh, uh, assets behind there. The pension plan could uh, have problems going down the road. Uh, uh, should you take a single uh, single life? Should you take a joint option? Period certain. Uh, the factors to to uh, to analyze include how long will you live? Your assets outside the retirement plan? Are you going to be making large purchases and need some cash during retirement? Maybe uh, pay down a uh, a mortgage to lower your cost of living. Uh, and there are also some non-company annuity alternatives that uh, uh, look very favorable. On the other hand, the lump sum, uh, it's very flexible. There's a potential guaranteed inheritance for, for heirs, inflation protection, estate planning flexibility, uh, but someone could spend through the lump sum if indeed uh, they do not have a, uh, a good plan uh, to, uh, to carry them and the, uh, uh, the, the fortitude to stick to that planning. If you have an investment process, are you wanting to leave a potential inheritance for your heirs and what is your break even when comparing the lump sum and the company uh, retirement check? Where do interest rates go from here? Obviously, if you thought interest rates were going to go up because we're going to have inflation, you take the uh, retirement plan with the uh, low, low discount rate, and then interest rates go up, you have your cake and eat it too. So again, we spend a lot of time on this. Um, the company gives you quite a few uh, documents to, to help us compare, and uh, this is part of our uh, ongoing process to get you ready for retirement. If you're under 59 and a half, uh, there are some ways to get money without a 10% penalty. Uh, One-time distribution, you can use uh, the IRS code section 72T that uh, will give you a formula for taking money out. Uh, net unrealized depreciation is, uh, is another tool in the proverbial uh, 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 tool, toolbox. Uh, some people will borrow money for a short period of time till they turn 59 and a half. Some people go back to work doing consulting, et cetera. Uh, or you might be selling an asset where you could support your lifestyle prior to then. So again, everybody's situation is different. Uh, the pre-59 is something we deal with on a regular, consistent basis. Another idea for consideration, currently the tax code reads, there are certain tax brackets where you have a 0% capital gains rate, as you can see down here. And so you might have some, some capital gains in an after-tax account. It, it could be wise to consider deferring those in retirement. Say you, def you retired on 1231 of this year, uh, deferring that till next year. You're not planning to take any ordinary income. You could potentially sell 
those stocks in an after-tax account and have a lower, if not a zero percent tax rate associated with that. So deferring capital gains, now this is contingent upon some some talk around the water cooler up in Washington, D.C. That, that this could be changing. So I'd say uh, sit tight. Stay tuned. Matt? Yeah, a few technical problems there. Uh, Matt, we're, uh, something happened with your microphone there. Can you hear us? There you go. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, thank you. Perfect. Yeah. Okay, thanks for keeping me honest. We are big believers in dividend income during, but also before retirement. Here's a good look dating back to the 1940s on what percentage of the total return, so total return being income plus price appreciation when stocks move higher or price depreciation when stocks would move lower. And draw your eyes to, to this bar over on the right, a little shy of half or 41% of the total return of the stock market has actually come from dividends. And so it's a very powerful tool but we, we really like dividends in retirement from a standpoint, it takes a lot of the risk out of the stock piece of your portfolio. If, if you need, say, 4% on, a, on a, your investment portfolio and, and you own all dividend-paying stocks that are paying 3%, well, at the end of the year, instead of selling 4% of your total principal, your capital, you would only in this example have to sell 1% based off the fact that you have dividends of 3%. So really helps from a standpoint of when you're needing money on a regular and consistent basis that these dividends can meet a majority, if not all of your, your income needs. You sometimes have folks come in and they say, you know what, I'm just not a stock investor. I want to own fixed income. And so uh, we want the investment portfolio to match. Our, our live well plan will tell you what rate of return you need, but uh, we try to give some perspective, a little history, if you will. Three periods of time we're gonna look at here, 1920 to 1940, you invest, you retired, you invested all your money in bonds and wow, you hit a home run. Treasury notes made almost uh, six and a half percent, followed by the second period of time, and this is real rate of return, real the return you get after subtracting out inflation and then we enter a period, another long period of time, 40 year period this time, where uh, you had a negative rate of return. Yes, you're seeing that correctly. After inflation, you actually backed up. Well, think what happened. We had the Second World War when the United States was what? Spending a lot of money, printing a lot of money. And uh, you had a long period of time where interest rates just went uh, up, up and up. And so therefore you didn't do very well if you were a safe bond investor followed by the, uh, the next period of time, a long period of time from 1982 to 2009, where interest rates uh, started down and you did very well by being a safe bond investor. Now, we can see with clarity, 100% accuracy, what uh, door number one, door number two, door number three is, but obviously you're most uh, uh, wanting to know what does the future look like as far as the time when I'm retired. So uh, uh, stay tuned. That's something we try to, uh, to do on a regular basis is keep uh, folks that are on our mailing list uh, uh, aware of what our fixed income allocation looks like. The other thing uh, where people can, uh, can, can stub their toe here <clears throat> is investing without a process. A uh, little bit of a busy chart, but one of my favorite charts. Look at the... Uh, the, the uh, uh, dark line, that's the performance of the S&P, the 500 largest stocks. And you can see right when this uh, dark green line almost got to the highest point, the lime green mountain there with the circle around it was where most of the money was invested into the stock market. So people were buying high uh, at a time. The stock market looks like it's doing well. It's going to do well forever. And therefore, I'm going to put some money in that's been on the sidelines. And then what happened there in 2008? Well, obviously we had a stock market pullback. The, the stock market went down. 
buying opportunity, toilet paper, to toothpaste, if you will, went on sale. And what happened? People took uh, lots and lots of dollars out of the stock market and bought bond funds. Uh, you can see bond fund flows are the gray uh, mountain there. Uh, the money came out of stocks, it went into bonds. So that was just the opposite of the old uh, adage, how do I do well in the stock markets? You buy low and sell high. More difficult because your emotions are involved if you're not investing without a process. Again, something we look at, we deal with on a regular systematic basis. So bottom line in our mind is you need an investment process. Uh, how much you can spend in retirement, <clears throat> how do you invest uh, <clears throat> your portfolio. Unfortunately, uh, many investors will make uh, less than good decisions when they're stressed out. Emotions get in the way and uh, uh, logic and reason sort of go out, the, uh, go out the door. We think discipline is key. We think income generation is paramount. Those are core principles of our process-driven investment strategy. Logic, logic, logic. Uh, the goal, the underlying philosophy is to protect your assets and also generate income and growth you need uh, to meet your objectives with the minimum risk, giving you a report card along the way of how we're doing. So let's look just real quickly here, planning after retirement. We think one of the things you should do is continue to stress test your portfolio. Here's a little bit of a busy chart, but in my mind, you'd say, well, okay, if a portfolio, if it's down 15%, what do you need to get back to break even? Well, the answer is not 15%. And the more money you, you are taking out from the portfolio, the bigger bogey you have to hit to overcome it. So let's look and say we had a 20% drawdown in your portfolio and you're taking out 4% from the portfolio per year. You don't need 20% to get back to break even you need between 35 and 36% just to get back to where you started. So con controlling risk is a lot more important in retirement than when you are just in the safe mode, when you're still working. And, and this is a big piece of, of retirement planning. What stocks do you own? How many stocks do you own? What type of fixed income? How do the two marry together? And the list goes on, but we think it is very, very important to continue distress test your portfolio in retirement. So again, as we meet, sit down with folks, uh, we go over uh, specific planning ideas for, for uh, each family to consider, uh, where to hold your assets, uh, how to make charitable contributions, uh, uh, how to give away appreciated stock, uh, where to best take your distributions for retirement, Roth conversions, uh, et cetera. And uh, again, it's all part of our written down uh, fiduciary centric holistic plan and we think this is uh, uh, key for uh, making sure you do your best job of planning for retirement. So happy to create a live well plan. There's no cost or obligation for us to do this. We think it's a good way for you to kick the tires if you're approaching retirement or have just recently retired and uh, uh, it's a good way for us to get to know you our promise is this, at the very least, you'll leave a more educated consumer. And uh, if we don't end up working together, we shake hands, part as friends, and, and we think you're better off with a little more information in your back pocket. So uh, once again, happy to do that. I know for a few people on the call, we've already done that plan. We think it is vitally important to continue to update that until you do uh, reach that, that retirement milestone. And when looking at hiring an advisor, here are a few of the more critical pieces that we would recommend. We've written all this down. We've put together a guide. It's on our website, 10 questions you should ask every financial advisor. And happy to email that to you if you shoot me an email after this, or, or you can just download it off our website. But are they a fiduciary? Does the advisor represent you or the bank? And it can't be both. So we think that is one of the more, is the most critical piece. Can you understand their cost structure or is it a little bit confusing? What type of experience do they have? We said earlier we think education really matters. Randy and I both have our CFP, our Certified Financial Planner designation. We both have our SEMA, Certified Investment Management Analyst designation. 
Uh, are you working with a team or just an individual? The, the old saying goes, you never want to hire a doctor that's going to retire before you do, just so you have to change doctors multiple times. And uh, the same holds true, we think, with advisors having a team of, of someone that has some, some runway left is very important. Randy already mentioned the niche. Over 90% of our clients are retired. And, uh, you know, we, we think, are you just a part of some little mousetrap that these people are putting together, or are they creating a personalized plan for you? And our, we, what we do is we don't have any cookie-cutter investment strategies that we offer to clients. We have, we have similar building blocks. We have over 15 inv investment strategies that we use for clients, but they're all put together in a different fashion for this live well plan as the backbone of what we're doing. Uh, how many clients they have, that's a great question to ask. And can you communicate? That, that should be a, a given, but can you communicate well with him or her on a number of these subjects? So the trains have run on time. I'm happy to report that we do appreciate uh, you joining us. Uh, please uh, feel free to reach out with any questions or comments. Uh, email address, phone numbers are there. Uh, Matt, uh, questions or uh, how are we looking on time? Yeah, only one question has come in so far. What's your average net worth, worth of your client for someone that's a few years for, from retirement? We're, we've we've been very humbled, very very thankful to work with a lot of great families. The the average size of a portfolio that we help manage is somewhere between one million and and ten million dollars. Net worth is probably in that range as well, and and so you know it's really the millionaires next door that would be our average client. Someone that is still saving, we we do have clients that have less than a million mark that are a few years from retirement. I think they'll get there before retirement. So that's not a, a a hard line in the sand by any stretch. Okay. But that looks to be the the, last, the only question so far, Randy. Well, that's the team. Uh, Maddie Kearns, Tiffany Solis, uh, myself, Matt, and uh, Melissa Hemner. And uh, again, uh, we're here to uh, to help with your uh, your concerns. We uh, welcome questions. And uh, as Matt said. Uh, if we sit down, there's no cost or obligation. If, there, if there's a good fit, we'll both know it. If not, uh, shake hands, part as friends, and uh, you will indeed be a better educated consumer to, uh, to go into retirement with. So um, again, if you're not on our email uh, list, uh, we welcome you to do that. Uh, let us hear from you if we can help and uh, have a great rest of the afternoon. Thanks so very much for joining us.